Christian Fellowship. This is our midweek service, which we call Prayer Lifters. We generally have, if you're visiting for the first time on Facebook and live streaming with us, we have a Bible study, which we'll be doing tonight, and then we have a time of, of prayer. Of course, we're not gathering uh, tonight and things, but uh, we are going to take a look at uh, the title of the study tonight is How to Pray Through a Pandemic. I touched about it on a little bit last Wednesday night, and we've been focusing on prayer. And boy, if there's ever a time we need to pray, we need to fellowship, we need to bond with uh, each other in fellowship and in the Lord, uh, this is this is that kind of a, of a time, uh, an unusual time, and a time that uh, you just can't have any preparation for. And I will tell you that I went to Bible College and Cal Baptist University and Golden Gate Theological Seminary. I think I have seven, eight, nine years of, uh, of education and four or five years of postgraduate uh, work. And, uh, you know, you're flying by the sea of your pants in dealing as a pastor with a pandemic such as this. I've jokingly said it's like building the airplane while it's flying. And no matter what you do, no matter what comes about, you you know, half the people will say one thing and then the other half the other thing. And, and you're almost in a no-win situation, but we have the victory in Christ Jesus and, and we win in Him. So those of you that are watching and uh, our Arbor Church friends and family, uh, Sandy sent out a global email if you haven't gotten it or you don't have your computer or it's Kaputsky. Uh, the global was that we're having our midweek Bible study tonight live stream. This Sunday we will live stream the, the services. But as of last Sunday, our church was open. And I didn't open it. Our church members opened it. They just showed up. And we had the front door left open as we were live streaming. And uh, I'm not going to tell you how many people we had, but it was very satisfying and pleasing that, that people came. And so... This, this uh, Sunday, which is Pentecost Sunday, we'll be having, a, I used to call it a soft opening. It's an opening period, and the front door will be left open, come in, and just, you know, this, this takes a lot of common sense. If you got a fever and you're sick and this and that, please stay home. If you're one among our wonderful seniors and you don't feel 100% comfortable coming, uh, yet, I'm with you, and no problem. Never, never give that a, a second thought. But we, we will have the front door open. You can come in, sit in your family groups. I suggest sitting every other row. That's more than six feet and things. And uh, it's optional to, to wear a mask. We talked about taking temperatures with a, a, a distant thing that's non-contact. Just for the safety and security, we're... We're very, our deacons, uh, when we met, uh, are very, very strong about safety and security. But praise God, they also said we need to make a stand as a church. So after 10 Sundays, it's, it's time. And of course, with President Trump, the President of the United States, saying the churches are essential, the churches are vital, and they need to be open now. And I think that's why uh, some of our people showed up last Sunday with no announcement, no fanfare, I didn't put anything out that we're having an opening, you all come. They just showed up. And so uh, we want to continue uh, a topic that we looked at last Wednesday. And I want to finish up the area of how to pray and praying through a pandemic. God will see us through this pandemic and uh, all the situation. And uh, like I said earlier, uh, I've got all kinds of degrees on the wall there. <laughs> I may be an educated fool. But they never had a class on what to do when you're on national shutdown and half your congregation says, open up. Other half say, hey, keep it close. And uh, so you just do what the Spirit of God uh, tells you to do. And I'm blessed at Arbor Christian Fellowship. They have a very kind, loving, understanding congregation. And half of this is just common sense. So with that in mind, let me begin. I want to just share four things in this Bible study tonight. Four things about uh, prayer, basic, basic things. I mean foundational things. And for any edifice or building to be built, it has to have a solid foundation. And, of course, I'm going to give you four uh, prayer 
thoughts and foundations uh, tonight to apply, and then we're going to uh, apply what we're going to applicate uh, there in some practical things. So we're going to take a look at uh, four things. Uh, number one, number one, relate to God in prayer as a child, our father and child aspect, father God the Father, and then we as a child of God, a son or daughter, we are adopted into the kingdom of God as believers in Christ. We're very, very much in the, the family of God. So relate to God in prayer as a child uh, and kind of look at it as a father-child aspect. In Matthew chapter 6, uh, and by the way, uh, the so-called Sermon on the Mount uh, in Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7 is very taught heavy with prayer. Prayer practicals, prayer suggestions, and it is in that Sermon on the Mount. In Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 through uh, 13, is we have what we call the Lord's Prayer. And uh, I, like a lot of, uh, well, since I'm a, a part-time semi-professional theologian, I, I look at things and... Uh, First of all, it's called the Lord's Prayer. It's a beautiful title. It's called the Lord's Prayer because it's a prayer that the Lord gave us to pray. He said in, in chapter 6, uh, verse 9, pray then in this manner. Pray in, in this way. Prayer practicals, I call it. But then again, it, it is not necessarily for real the Lord's Prayer because Christ never needed to have to pray that. Because it says, forgive us our sins, forgive us our debts. As we, and Christ never needed to pray for forgiveness. So most scholars, most theologians, most commentators will call this Christ model prayer. Christ model prayer. Luke chapter 11, it talks about uh, that the disciples heard Jesus pray. He prayed fervently, passionately. Uh, he prayed relationally with God the Father as the Son of God. He prayed, and after he finished that prayer, it was probably Peter, uh, asked, Lord, teach us to pray. Lord, and that's something that we need to understand that we are ever learning. We're always in the kindergarten of prayer, even though you might think you have a Ph.D. or a master's degree in prayer, we, we always ought to have the heart and attitude that we're in the kindergarten of prayer and learning. One fascinating thing that fascinates me as a pastor, preacher, and uh, a person, I believe, a person of prayer, is that when they heard Jesus pray, they said, Lord, teach us to pray. Now, they've heard Jesus preach. They didn't say, Lord, teach us to preach. They saw Jesus do miracles. They didn't say, Lord, teach us to do miracles. But when they heard Jesus pray passionately, fervently, with clarity and, and charity, they said, Lord, teach us to pray. And that is when Jesus gave this model prayer that we call the Lord's Prayer. And so it begins, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be your name. So I'm just going to relate to only that. Our Father, we approach God as children. Even at my age, as a, as a person that's older, or somebody that has a, a lot of experience, or somebody that has a lot of miles behind me, and I hope a lot of miles ahead of me, I still need to and must relate to God the Father, our Father which art in heaven, as his child. And even though I've done prayer seminars all over the world and taught prayer in, at Golden Gate Baptist Theological Seminary and, and, and all that, I still have to approach God as a child. I still need to be praying that prayer. Lord, teach us to pray. Uh, learn about prayer. But the beauty of that, that, that prayer request, Lord, teach us to pray, I used to always uh, misinterpret that verse when I taught in, in the earlier parts. Uh, I, I would always, uh, you know, say, Lord, teach us how to pray. And that's what I would say. But it doesn't really say teach us how to pray. It says teach us to pray. And so God will put us in situations and circumstances like what we've been going through nationally for the last, uh, as they say, 68 days to pray. To The issue is not that you have all these techniques and all this finesse 
about prayer, but that you pray, that, that, that you pray. Uh, sometimes the most stumbling, inelegant prayer that's from the heart is just as wonderful as when the pastor gets up there with a written out prayer with all these eloquent words, eloquent words and things. No, uh, teach us to pray. So number one, number one aspect in praying through a pandemic, praying when there's tribulation, praying when there's a, a trial, praying when we're being tested, praying uh, when we're at our wits end and tired, of the of the situation and so don't worry tonight i'm going to stay in my own lane no medical advice no political commentary i'll leave that to the pros i'm going to stay in my own lane and that's the word of god encouraging believers in christ so number one relate to god in prayer as a child as a child uh, in that father and child aspects. Romans 8.15 is a, is a beautiful uh, verse. We're going to take a look at a couple of other portions of Romans chapter 8. But Romans 8.15, Jesus talks about that we need to cry out to the Father in Paul's letter there and use the word Abba, Abba, as we, as we pray. And Abba is more than a Swedish light rock and roll group from the 70s and, and 80s. Abba uh, means father, but literally in the Aramaic, Abba means daddy. Daddy. Wouldn't you agree with me that there's a difference between being a biological father and being a daddy? I hope one is both. But oftentimes there's a difference. Not all biological fathers are, are daddies. And uh, some of you watching may have grown up with an absentee father or a distant father or, or whatnot. But God, our Father, is always there. And we approach, we approach God in prayer as a child, as a daddy, as daddy. And that's just a, a beautiful, wonderful uh, there in Romans 8.15, the scripture says that we cry out as a child. We cry out, Abba, Abba, A-B-B-A. -B -B -A. Now, here's the beauty. I mean, this might be a little strange, and you might laugh, and you, you might say, you know, really, are you serious, Pastor? But Abba, Abba is a word that you can say without teeth. You can gum it. You can say it with your lips. A lot of words that we speak in the English language, we have to use our teeth, you know, push our tongue lightly to the back of our teeth or the bottom of our teeth to enunciate. Well, to say the word Abba, you could say it without having any teeth. No uppers or lowers and no teeth. And the application here that's so beautiful is that a baby, a child that has no teeth can cry out Abba. And the elderly person who's, who lost their teeth or lost their dentures uh, can still cry out, Abba, without teeth. And it's, it's the cry, the crying out, Abba. And actually crying out, Abba, and going before God in prayer as a child elevates prayer in our life to a dazzling and dizzying height. It talks about us humbling ourselves and childlikeness. It, it gives three things. Three things that it gives. Number one, dependence. Number two, direction. And number three, destination. Prayer takes us where God wants, us, wants to take us. Prayer changes things. That's the old adage. Remember the picture of the praying hands? Uh, and then under it, it will say, Prayer changes things. Yes, that's true. But also, remember this. Get this. Prayer changes you. Prayer changes me. There's something transformative about praying. So as a child, we, we pray in dependence. And uh, children, uh, raising, you know, my children, we, uh, we see that as a child they're dependent upon us. 
And of course, as they hit a certain year and they hit their teen years, they try anything and everything to be independent and things. And then when they get older and have children of their own, they, they once again get dependent on, on mom and dad for help, advice, tips, a loan, or, or whatnot. I, I remember when I, I joined the Marine Corps, I joined to get away, uh, among other reasons, to get away from mom and dad. I was sick and tired of mom and dad telling me what to do. So I joined the Marine Corps. And of course, that was kind of a, 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 a you know, uh, the Marine Corps for three years told me what to do. But the funny thing is, as much as I wanted to get away from mom and dad, when I was in the Marine Corps, I looked for every way possible to get a weekend leave or a weekend pass and get home and see mom and dad and, and be with mom and dad. What I'm trying to say about all this mom and dad stuff and child stuff is that as a child is dependent upon a mother and a father, we are dependent upon God as a child. So as we pray through this pandemic, as we deepen our prayer life, as we raise the level of our praying, we bump it up to the next level, so to speak. Relate to God in prayer as a child. As God our Father. That's why the Lord's Prayer or the model prayer begins with the words, Our Father, which art in heaven. Notice the our and notice the plural. Our Father. Our Father. And so there are times that we pray privately, individually. I do most of mine early in the morning. This morning I, I spent an hour in prayer. Uh, with a cup of Starbucks, and it was intercession for my pastor friends uh, around the world that I have on, in my prayer journal. I'll talk a little bit more about that. Yesterday, I prayed for my pastor friends in California, especially, and two days before, I, I have a list of my high school chums from Camden High School, San Jose, if you're watching, you know, you know who you are, uh, and things, and so just go ahead and, and pray. And, and the best prayer tip about getting good at prayer, this is not rocket science, nothing scientific, nothing. You just pray. That's why the disciples said, Lord, teach us to pray. Teach us to pray. And Jesus showed in answer this model prayer. We begin with our Father. We are relate to him as a child. We relate to him as a daddy. As a daddy. Come before God as daddy. Now, when I was a brand new Christian, I, I was pretty, you know, ignorant, dumb, you know, <laughs> dumb and things. And I first felt that, that I wasn't worthy to pray. I, you know, let the old saints in the church with the gray hair and, and, and let them pray. Or the pastors or the staff, let them pray. Let them pray. And me, you know, I'm not worthy to pray. Well, I'm not. It's a gift of God. But only because we've been adopted in God's family are, are we able to pray and should pray? I can't go. When I was a teenager, I couldn't go to somebody around the block that weren't related to me and go up to them and just say, Hey, can you get me a Fender Stratocaster guitar? Can you buy one for me? I couldn't. What? Well, I was not related to them. I was not their son. I was that nuisance kid down the street. But I could go to my mother and father and Christmas list or birthday or son what do you want for Christmas hey dad I want a Fender Stratocaster electric guitar and uh, why because I'm their son same principle is true with praying to God our father our father our father so let me say it one more time with feeling and finesse rely on God yes but relate to God in prayer as a child, in dependence, being dependent upon him as a child is dependent most everything uh, when they're a toddler, uh, when they're in elementary school to mom and dad and things. Uh, most kindergartners and toddlers don't have jobs and they don't put the bacon on the table. Mom and dad may have a job or dad have a job and they provide they provide uh, food. They provide, uh, you know, uh, their needs and clothes. And so 
Most of all, we are dependent upon God. Second, God gives direction. Uh, you know, a, a good mother and father give direction to their children. Uh, it's called discipline. And by the way, discipline is not negative in the sense, okay, just spank them. Discipline also is praising them, giving direction. It's, it's the whole shebang. It gives direction, dependence, and then destination. Where, where we're going, where God is leading us. So, first thing, relate to God in prayer as a child. Number two, finally, number two, rely, all these begin with ours, uh, rely on the Holy Spirit to energize us in our praying. I'm not talking about tongues or an unknown language. I'm talking about what it says in the book of Romans, chapter 8, verse 26 and 27. So if you have your Bibles, you can go ahead and turn there. I've got mine here. Romans 8, 26 and 28. Now, Romans 8 is one of the most wonderful chapters in the Bible. I thought about writing a devotional study book on Romans chapter 8. Because it is so rich. I mean, it, it is so fantastically rich. Uh, it begins with uh, this verse. There's no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. There's no condemnation. It ends with there is no separation. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. Height, depth, breadth, nothing. So the chapter begins with no condemnation. And it ends with no separation. Isn't that wonderful? And everything in between also. This is one of the highlight chapters. Uh, when we look at the book of Romans, we're not in the shadowy foothills of the Himalayas. We are on the peak. We are on K2. We're on Mount Austin. God, we're on the top of the peaks of God's Himalayas, so to speak. And so here's what Romans 8, 26, 28 uh, say, 26 through 28. Now, I said earlier, depend and relate upon God as a child, uh, as father, daddy. Second, number two, rely on the Holy Spirit to energize us in our praying. Energize and mobilize are the two buzzwords. They all end up with eyes. Energize us. Mobilize us. So, Romans 8, 26 through 28. And uh, Paul talks uh, a good bit here about prayer, just as he did in the Sermon on the Mount. Romans 8, 26, 28. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we should, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. He who searches the hearts knows the mind of the Spirit, and it's because he intercedes and prays with us. And then one of the most beautiful verses in the entire Bible is in the context of the Holy Spirit energizing and mobilizing us. You've heard this verse before, as I love to say. If you've gotten your exercise running around in evangelical circles, you, you know this verse. You may not know the address, the address is Romans 8.28, and it is a capstone and a finishing to the Holy Spirit leading us and guiding us in prayer. Verse 28, we know, and we know that God causes all things, now, sound familiar? Of course it does. We know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God. That's the first prerequisite, love God. Love God. That's why the great commandment, love the Lord thy God with all your heart. That's why Jesus said to the disciples, do you love me more than these, these things? Do you love me more? Um, love is, is that the issue. We know that God causes all things to work together. Now, let me remind you, not all things are good. That bankruptcy you may have filed years ago, that, that illness, that divorce you went through that you didn't want to have, that situation with your son or daughter, the, the passing of a, of a loved one, a family member, uh, that loss of, of a job, or you not getting that promotion that you worked hard for or counted on, uh, you know, those things are, are not 
all that good. But the scripture says all things work together for a good. As Clint Eastwood would say, the good, the bad, and the ugly. The good, the bad, and the ugly. All things work together to those who love God and are the called according to his purpose. If God wants to use you and you want to be used of, of God, realize this. So the Holy Spirit helps us in our praying because uh, we do not know really how to pray in a lot of cases. He is our teacher. Holy Spirit is our instructor. By the way, this is so beautiful. Mark this down. I mean, just get it in your mind. Even when you pray alone in your car or in a room or at night by yourself, you never, ever pray alone. You have the Holy Spirit with you interceding and Jesus interceding. And so you never, ever pray alone. He helps us in our praying. Energize and mobilize. Energize and mobilize. The third thing, the third thing begins with an R. Return all the glory to God in answered prayer. Return all the glory to God in answered prayer. What prayers he answers, return all the glory to God. Uh, I did some Bible prayer seminars, actually, now that I think about it, I remember all over the world, and one of the, the things, and one of the themes I talked about was called the answer to unanswered prayer. The answer to unanswered prayer. I think Randy Travis wrote a song and sang a song about that, that he thanked God for unanswered prayer. I don't know the whole, all the details and you know, it, it may not be the most preachable thing, so let me get to my thought here. Um, there's no such thing. I would argue, biblically, that there's no such thing as unanswered prayer. Yes, there is unheard prayer if our hearts are not right with God. I touched upon that a little bit last Wednesday night. But uh, God answers uh, every prayer that he hears with a yes, with a no, with a later, or he answers the prayer different. I can't tell you how many prayers God has answered different than what I wanted the answer to be. And you know what? A hundred percent God's answer that was different than what I wanted was always way better than what I, I wanted. So return all the glory to God in answered prayer. There's no such thing technically as unanswered prayer. God says yes. Now, he may not do it instantly. It might take a little bit of time. Or there may be an instantaneous prayer in a situation, but there's a yes. Sometimes there's a no. And you know what? The no is for our own good. The no is for our own good. Let me use an illustration. Let's say you had a year and a half toddler. And let's say you were using basic razor blades, uh, Dad, to shave. And the toddler got in your drawer and got in your shaving kit. And all of a sudden, he's playing with razor blades. You know what's going to happen? He's going to get his hand all cutty and cut up. And, you know, and, and so, you, you, you know, it's a no. <laughs> no razor blades. No. Well, sometimes God gives us a, a soft no or a hard no in our prayer for our own good. And I think the next thing that the no is because God wants to give us something different, something even better. So return all the glory to God in answered prayer. And the last thing is going to be a more of a practical application, I think, something for you to do, uh, something physically uh, to do if you haven't yet. I, I challenge you, and I talk a lot about this in my prayer conferences and things, uh, Record in a journal your prayer journey, your, your answers, your laters, your yes, your no's, your different answers. Uh, start up a prayer journal uh, for two or three reasons. Number one, to have a central location of your prayer re request. You know, sometimes our minds forget. And, you know, wouldn't you agree with me that today 
in our culture in the year 2020. Wouldn't you agree with me that often we suffer from what has been called information overload? We actually live in what is called the, you know, the information age, the so-called third revolution, you know, the industrial age and this age and now the information age. And, uh, but we have information overload. We sometimes freeze. And, and so I used to keep track of my prayer on little scraps of paper. I just you know write down names of people and prayer requests and things, and I'd write them down in little sca scraps of paper and keep them in my pocket. And even though that was a noble cause and a noble thought, uh, what do you think happened? <laughs> I forgot to reach into my pocket, you know, later on or the next day. And then when my wife did my laundry and pulled the pants, you know, from the hamper and into the thing, and she would reach down in the pocket, you know, take out any maybe loose change or. And then she'd find these little strips and scraps of paper with names of people on them. And they're, you know, so I, I, I scrap the scraps, okay? I, I scrap the scrap, and I put them on three-by-five cards. I just, you know, I'm, I would flashcard three-by-five cards in my church office or at night or during a prayer time. Sometimes I would go on a prayer walk for 45 minutes around the block, and I'd carry the three-by-five cards in my pocket and then pull them out and, you know, you know, list the names and, and things and, and, and all that. But the ultimate is just keeping a prayer journal. By the way, this is one of my prayer journals. And this is my gamer. You know, all baseball players have a bat that they call their gamer. That's the one that they use for the game. It's, it's, they call it the gamer. Well, this is my gamer when it comes to prayer. And I have, I have a list of my Camden High School friends pastors from all over America, church roster of church members, um, just a variety of names and lists, and I'm, I'm one of these guys. I guess I must have been infatuated with the book of lists when it came out, David Wallachinsky and them that wrote that book, and I bought, bought that and loved reading it and things. But I, I challenge you to keep a, a prayer journal. Uh, you know, uh, record your prayer ups and downs and progress. And, 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 and progress and I, I date and put the time and though I'm not a slave to time and I'm not run and driven by time but I discovered that when I really start praying and I have a list and pray about the people I love and care about pray for our church members uh, I'm shocked how quick and how fast the time goes by so lesson number two <laughs> uh, of my journey in my prayer life is I told you earlier I had the scraps of paper and I scrapped that for a prayer journal. I remember when I determined, okay, I'm going to give more time and more depth to praying. Short, quick, shallow prayers or only emergency prayers. Lord, get me out of trouble prayers. I wanted to take my prayer life a little deeper because I love God. And I was able to relate uh, my relationship with my wife when I fell in love with her. Uh, you know, I wanted to spend more time with her. I, you know, five minutes wasn't enough. I wanted to, you know, spend as much time possibly as I could with her. And, you know, the same thing happens when we love God. We, we want to spend time with Him and a minute, two minutes, a uh, quick prayer and this, it, you know, is not enough. And you grow into it and, and you want more. So I made a determination that I will pray an hour. And I got that from Jesus there before Gethsemane when the disciples and Peter fell asleep at his most crucial moment. They, these guys, you know, these knuckleheads, uh, pardon of the, the expression, these knuckleheads were asleep. And what did Jesus say? What? Could you not watch and pray? Could you not for one hour? And I just thought, okay, you know, one hour, I think in the course of a day, maybe spread out, maybe 10 minutes at a time, uh, or often, you know, a full hour at a time, and it goes deeper. So I'll never forget, and you might, I hope you get a chuckle out of this, and I hope you can relate to it too, if you've tried to augment and lengthen and strengthen your prayer disciplines. Uh, I, I remember, you know, the first day, I'm going to pray an hour, knelt down, and I started praying, and uh, I, I noted what time I started just 
you know, because I looked down and there's my wristwatch, but then I stopped looking at my wristwatch and bowed my head and prayed. And I prayed for a real long, long time. I just said, man, I said, so I looked at my watch and it was like three, three minutes, I mean, three minutes. So what I'm trying to get across is length and a, a time of prayer. You grow into that naturally. And, and I don't want you to be legalistic. And I wasn't really legalistic. It just flowed. So I, I challenge you to, as far as from this study, as I finish up, a practical application to applicate. If you have not already started up a prayer journal, uh, get yourself a little notebook, something like, like this. Just one of these, you know, just notebooks, blank. You can and uh, make it and dedicate it to being a prayer journal. Now I divide it up into sections. So one of the, 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 the things is that to use uh, is to look upon prayer um, as a fist, uh, as a fist, or like like a fist, and, and so you have your pointing finger. You can pray for direction. You have got your middle finger, which is a little longer. You pray about stretch, but stretching. You got your this finger here, which commonly, if you're married, is a ring finger. Pray for your family, your spouse, your relationships, your, your children. And then your thumb is, well, you use the thumb to work. You know, it would be most impossible to do a lot of things without a thumb. So uh, the thumb is the area of work. Pray about your work and service. And then your little pinky, the little finger, the least significant finger, or the, and the shortest one, that's praying for you. Praying for you, called petition. So, you know, have, a, you know, pray, pray the fist, pray the hand. I, I teach that to my uh, students in my prayer seminars and in my new Christian, new believer orientation. And I had the privilege of praying and, and teaching prayer to the new members and the staff at Saddleback Church. All the staff except Pastor Rick. And Pastor Rick and I used to, meet for prayer early in the morning uh, and just, just pray, intercede and things. So enhance your prayer life by praying as a child, totally dependent upon God. God, our Father, pray in dependence, seek direction, trust God for destination, cry out, Abba, Daddy. You, you may still have your teeth, but as I said earlier, you can pray to Abba, the Father, Daddy, when you're a baby, before your teeth have come out, or when you're older, when you don't have any left, and you can, with your lips, you can say Abba without your teeth. And then let the Holy Spirit energize, mobilize, direct you in your praying. He leads and guides us, and He prays with us. And even though you pray all by yourself and not maybe with your spouse or family or your pastor or in a group, you never pray alone when you pray alone. The Spirit is with you. You are, ad you are addressing God the Father, God your Father, your Daddy. And the Bible also says that Jesus is also making intercession for you as you pray. You talk about triple power. You talk about triple threat. You know, in college football, they talk about football players that, you know, are triple threats. They can run, they can throw, uh, they can block. You know, they're thr triple threats. Well, we have God's triple. God's triple. The Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, all. We pray to God the Father in that daddy-child relationship. Jesus prays with us. The Holy Spirit prays with us. The Holy Spirit, as it says, as I mentioned in Romans 8, 26 through 28, energizes us. And the last thing is return all the glory to God. You pray like this. You're going to see answers to prayer. You're going to see God at work, God moving. And then I challenge you uh, to keep a journal. If you want some information or tips on on some of that. You don't have to have it be perfect. The, 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 the thing is, you just do it. 
uh, you know, you can email me uh, for help on how to have a journal. Uh, if there's a Bible bookstore around you, there are pre-made journals that you can you can pray, record your answers. I, I keep in this prayer journal uh, prayer studies that I've developed. I have a whole encyclopedia of prayer promises and prayer verses, and then I have a, a list of, of names and things, and then I, I have countries by name and pastors where I've preached or ones that I know praying for missionaries, praying for other pastors. I pray that God will lengthen and strengthen them. I pray that God will lengthen and strengthen your prayer life tonight. As I conclude, I'm, I'm, I'm finished. I hope that this gave you some insight. I hope that uh, I'm assuming most of you watching, I mean, watching on a Wednesday night and listening to Pastor Danny, you, you, you must be committed and, and you must have some kind of a, a prayer life. I challenge you to take it to the next level. Take it to a little more and a, a little deeper. So I'm done. Let me pray us out here. If you've been watching, if you've been watching, just click in. Just click in. Uh, I, I'm watching or your name or just watching and we want to know. You know why? Because that's going to become my prayer list tomorrow and Friday and this weekend and things. So click in. And let me remind you, we will be live streaming 1045 California Pacific Standard Time at Arbor Christian Fellowship on this same uh, Facebook uh, site. This next Sunday is the day of Pentecost. And it's a great time, 50 days after Easter, 50 days after the Passover to, to open up. Actually, as I mentioned earlier, we, we opened up uh, last Sunday, my congregation, some of the people came and uh, we opened up. So God bless you. Let me pray for you and pray you out of here. Mike Benninger requests prayer. It's uh, storming big time in San Antonio. We have a viewer and a friend of ours, a friend of, of, of uh, Captain Vic, Marine Corps, and a friend of mine, uh, Mike Benninger, who is in Texas. There is a big time storm right now, and he's viewing, and he asks for prayer. So, uh, Brother Benninger, I'm going to go ahead and lead in, in prayer. God bless you, and uh, hey, Semper Fi, Devil Dog. Heavenly Father, we just come, and I pray for Mike and the area there going through this massive uh, storm and things, and we pray for protection, and we pray that it will pass. I pray for every viewer that uh, you would give us a, a, a hunger. Lord, I was just hoping to uh, salt and wet some of our viewers' appetite to just take prayer to the, the next level. And Lord, I can't think of a better time than this pandemic and all the craziness going around uh, around about us to, to, to pray and to put some things down. Oh, Lord, to have a, a prayer list of praying for our leaders, our pastors, our, our church members, our family, our friends. I thank you, Lord, that I can come to you crying out, Abba, Daddy, Daddy. I thank you for this time of prayer. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.